Hey, good morning. So it's true, I am going to talk to you about HPV for boys and the cost effectiveness analysis that we did in Alberta. So as an overview, uh, first I'm going to talk about cost effectiveness analysis. And here I'm just going to introduce it as a concept. Um, maybe you're familiar with it, maybe you're not. If you are, just bear with me. Um, but hopefully through this introduction, if you ever come across cost effectiveness in the future, you'll feel more comfortable interpreting it. Uh, the models we used in Alberta, in the Alberta analysis are the next topic, so we access two models and input Alberta data into them. So I'll just give you an overview of the models and some differences between them. Uh, next I'll talk about the parameter estimates that we used for Alberta, so the specific Alberta inputs that made this truly an Alberta analysis. And finally I'll go over the cost effectiveness results and the implications for programs. Uh, first, I have nothing to disclose. Uh, so, cost effectiveness analysis. Um, so, cost effectiveness is a type of economic analysis that helps us compare relative costs and outcomes or benefits uh, for two different courses of action. So, in health, we usually measure the outcome or the benefit in terms of health utility. Uh, so, this is called cost utility analysis. So, this is the first place people get confused. You see cost effectiveness analysis, cost utility analysis. Well, cost utility analysis is actually a subset of cost effectiveness analysis. So here we're talking about cost utility analysis, but if you see the two, they're kind of interchangeable, but not quite, because one is sort of a subset of the other. Um, and when we talk about health utility, uh, we're usually talking about quality adjusted life years, which is the methodology for sort of valuing health. So you can live a year of life in perfect quality, that's worth uh, one quality adjusted life year. If you live life for a certain amount of, a certain amount of time with a certain uh, disutility, this will account for that. So it's not just the disutility, it's also the duration for which you live in that disutility. Um, so the common outcome measure for cost effectiveness analysis or cost utility analysis is the incremental cost effectiveness ratio. So this ratio basically takes the net costs um, over the net qualities between any two interventions. So if we're comparing for HPV, for example, a scenario where we're not immunizing at all to a scenario where we introduce female immunization, we're looking at the net costs of no intervention. So how much did it cost to treat people for HPV in that year compared to the net costs uh, if you do have an intervention? So uh, what does the immunization program cost and how much are we avoiding in the treatment long term? Um, and in the denominator, you see uh, the change in qualities. So hopefully this program is actually benefiting people, so we'll see a positive uh, denominator. So uh, you're gaining quality adjusted life years with most interventions. Um, so this is a cost effectiveness plane, and I find it the most useful way to visualize cost effectiveness. So at the origin, you can see that uh, C. So that kind of represents the comparator program. So in the scenario I was just talking about, imagine that we're not immunizing at all, um, and then you're comparing it to scenarios where you start to introduce, say, female immunization, or maybe um, you're comparing currently doing female immunization and introducing males. The base program is always vi viewed as being at the origin, and then the comparator program could lay anywhere on that plane, so in any of the four quadrants. So um, I'll go through the quadrants one by one. So in the northeast quadrant, uh, your new effective your new treatment is more effective but also more costly. So you're gaining quality adjusted life years but you're also paying money for them. You're not saving money but you're gaining health. Um, in the southeast quadrant, uh, you have a less costly treatment that also ha gains uh, qualities. So you'll always do that. If you ever have a chance to gain qualities and save money, you kind of be dumb not to do it. So southeast, don't worry, like you don't even really need to do a detailed cost effectiveness analysis, it's just a good idea. Um, in the southwest quadrant, your new treatment is less costly but less effective. So you're saving money, but you're not treating people as well. So it's kind of a trade-off between where you're comfortable in that range. And then in the northwest quadrant, uh, it's less effective and it's more costly, so just don't do it. So basically we have two quadrants that we really have to think about hard and two quadrants where it's quite easy. So looking at those two quadrants that uh, require some consideration, the northeast and the southwest quadrants, you can see that dotted line sort of bisecting the origin. And that line is basically the cost effectiveness threshold that any given jurisdiction is comfortable with. So um, in most jurisdictions, in at least the western world, uh, we're usually looking at about $50,000 per quality adjusted life year. Uh, some s sources say that you should be looking at the GDP per capita, which in Alberta is about $75,000 per quality adjusted life year, so we actually might be willing to pay 
more here in Alberta because we're a little bit more affluent. Um, a lot of jurisdictions in Canada also look at a $40,000 uh, per quality threshold. So before you do cost effectiveness analysis, most jurisdictions should really decide what they're comfortable with. Um, I've also had some comments that some people feel that there should be a different threshold for acute care versus uh, public health. Again, these are just questions that every jurisdiction has to consider. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the models that we used. So they are both cost utility models, and they're both developed to test the ICER for multiple scenarios. So you're always comparing a baseline to a new intervention uh, here, such as increasing female coverage or including males in the HPV program. So the first model is from Merck Pharmaceutical, the developer of uh, Gardasil. And I should say here that um, we only looked at the quadrivalent vaccine in this analysis. So um, while it's from Merck, this did go through peer review. It was uh, endorsed by other bodies and it was seen not to be biased, although it is important to consider that it did come from a pharmaceutical company. Uh, and the Chasson model is from the CDC in the US and it was actually created to sort of test the validity of the Merck models. So they're nicely used as a pair. Um, all right. So they both study the same long-term sequelae, and this is one of the main differences that this HPV for boys analysis included. We're looking not just at cervical cancer and genital warts, we're also looking at vaginal, vulvar, head and neck, anal and penile cancers, which weren't really included in the first cost effectiveness analyses that were done for HPV. And this is over a time span of 100 years. Uh, why 100 years? Because you don't see HPV-related cancers for at least 50 years before after children are immunized and uh, it will take that long for the disease really to reach a steady state at a new um, stable place. So in each model, you input the current incidence, so Alberta's current incidence for all these HPV-related cancers and genital warts, um, and it will establish a steady state for the disease. So you just assume that that's constant. Uh, we also assume heterosexual mixing, and this is an important thing to keep in mind because the program is likely to become a lot more cost effectiveness if you were to consider non-heterosexual mixing uh, just because those populations wouldn't be protected by female-only immunization. Uh, finally, uh, you tabulate the costs and the quality adjusted life years for that whole time span and you discount them at 3% annually. So the first model, the Merck model, uh, Albasha and Dasbach is a dynamic model, so by dynamic I mean that you're accounting for herd immunity in the model. So immunizing one person doesn't just benefit that person, you kind of have these spillover effects and this model will account for it the higher your coverage goes. Um, it is SIRS model, so that means it accounts for uh, susceptibility, uh, infection, recovery, and renewed susceptibility. So you actually might revert to becoming susceptible. Um, and this can kind of make it more or less cost effective depending on the parameterization. Uh, the model is fitted to uh, uh, simulate observed incidents, so you don't exactly put the incidents into the model, you actually fit the model to output the incidents you're looking for. Um, so some key features that make this model different than the other one are the grouping of the age cohorts. So this model is grouped into 23 age cohorts rather than single year age groups, and this can actually bias the model to become slightly more cost effective because um, the way these groups will move through, it'll actually amplify the coverage in different groups. And um, I'm not gonna say too much more about that, but if you have questions, feel free to ask. Um, there's three sexual activity levels. So you actually um, differentiate between people who are higher risk and low risk, although that doesn't impact who receives immunization. Uh, the probability of HP acquisition is determined by age, gender, and the sexual activity level. Um, so after, uh, acquisition is modeled, the progression of the disease is also modeled, and that's not done in the second model, it's just assumed. Um, screening is modeled, so here in this model we could actually look at what impacts and um, changes in cervical screening protocols uh, would have, and uh, the probability of detection by cancer stage. So in the Chisson model, again that's from the CDC, uh, it's a simplified dynamic model, so basically they've taken a lot of the dynamic features and just made a few simplifying assumptions that made this model a lot easier to interpret and removed some uncertainty in some of the parameters. Uh, it's SIR model, so they assumed that once you've recovered, you never get HPV again. Um, so the model observed incidents as a model Im uh, input, so we actually just put Alberta cancer rates right into the model and it's that easy, so we can be pretty certain that we got that right. Uh, the population is not classified to sexual activity level. Um, the probabilities are therefore age and sex specific, but not relying on uh, the sexual activity. Um, the reduction in long-term sequelae is assumed to be equal to the percentage re reduction in lifetime exposure. So 
via immunization, you're reducing your exposure, and they just assume that that directly impacts whether or not you get cancer in the long term. So it's a simplifying assumption, but it's a reasonable one. And cervical screening isn't modeled. You just make the Cheddaris Paribus uh, assumption that nothing changes. And a, a higher vaccine efficacy was assumed in this model from the CDC as compared to the uh, Merck model. Uh, so next I'll talk about the parameter estimates that we put in for Alberta. Uh, the model output four scenarios. Basically, I looked at a baseline where there was no immunization, so before we introduced any program. Uh, the current scenario where we have female-only coverage at 61%, and then two comparator strategies. One, increasing coverage in females to 75% with no male immunization, so just kind of extending the current program. And the second is uh, keeping female coverage at 61%, really just not pushing on that, and is introducing males, and we assume that the coverage would be equal to what it is in females. Um, now, a note on the 75%, there was a survey a few years ago uh, asking parents whether or not they'd be willing to get their child immunized, and it actually had pretty stark results. 50% said yes, absolutely, 25% said no, and 25% uh, said maybe. So if we take that, those numbers as given, 75% um, is a pretty high ceiling on the coverage we could expect to get. Uh, the base cost is $85 per dose, which includes delivery. In Alberta, we estimate the school-based program delivery to be about $10 a dose. Uh, over the time span of 100 years, with lifetime immunity, Alberta costs epidemiology and demographics. And demographics, I'm not just talking about the population structure, I'm also talking about mortality patterns, not just from disease, but also background mortality. Uh, so the cost estimates. So one of the best things I think about this analysis is we were actually able to put Alberta costs into the model and while it may seem easy, oh how much does cost, uh, cancer cost to treat in Alberta, it's actually very complex and few jurisdictions are able to pinpoint exact estimates on how much cancer is cost to treat. So to do this in Alberta, we created a cohort of cancer patients uh, via the cancer registry and matched them to five controls who didn't have cancer and differenced their, their one-year costs and assumed that that incremental amount was the surgical um, inpatient and physician care component of their cancer care. Uh, chemotherapy costs uh, aren't captured in that way, so they were accessed via the AHS camp Cancer Pharmacy and we took a one-year sample of patients. And radiation costs were estimated by adjusting the total costs in the literature because we actually did not have costing available for radiation, but we did use um, the proportion of treatment plans in Alberta that were supposed to receive uh, radiation as part of their initial treatment plan. Uh, the other parameters specific to Alberta, uh, the cancer incidence and mortality was taken from the Alberta Cancer Registry Annual Report. Uh, the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer gave us uh, screening outcomes. Uh, the demography was taken from the Alberta Interactive Health Data Repository, the IHDA, and I'd encourage you to check that out if you haven't seen it before. Um, and then the quality, so the quality adjusted life years, efficacy, and the proportion of disease attributable to different HPV types were taken from the models themselves, so those were not changed for this analysis. So now I'll talk about our results. Uh, first, the Merck model. So here, remember when I was talking about comparing a baseline program to a new strategy, we're comparing here in column A, having no program to the current program, which is female coverage, at 61%. So the incremental cost effectiveness ratio is actually cost saving. So we're sort of sitting in that um, southeast, I believe, quadrant where it's a pretty good idea. You're saving money and you're gaining health benefits. So, um, and brackets denote cost savings, I should say. So um, it's very favorable, we're doing really well according to this model. Now comparing the current scenario to um, a, a scenario where we increase female coverage to 75%, uh, you're not cost saving anymore, the ICER is $7,700, but this is a quite a low um, cost effectiveness ratio and this is generally accepted to be quite cost effective, so that scenario looks pretty good. Um, now comparing the current scenario to um, introducing boys at the same level as, as girls, um, the ICER is $42,800, so this is above the $40,000 ICER that a lot of jurisdictions are looking at, but below the $50,000 and certainly below the GDP per capita in this province. Uh, the Chasson model was actually generally more cost effective than the Merck model. Uh, comparing no program to introducing girls, so the current program that we have was cost saving. Uh, increasing coverage in females was actually cost saving as well and uh, introducing boys was found to be uh, 
not cost saving, but cost effective at $17,000 per quality. Uh, I should note that in a more formal analysis, uh, we would also, I, and we have done this, I'm just not presenting this right now, we would vary the price and vary a lot of other parameters just so you could see how they'd move with them, um, with those changes. Um, now this is one slide that I think answers really well to the equity question because you're saying why aren't you immunizing boys, they're not going to benefit. And of course we know that they benefit from the herd immunity effect. But if we actually compare the long-term incidence in HPV 16 and 18, um, over 100 years, you can see that increasing female coverage to 75% is really favorable for girls. When you see that lowest dark line, it's kind of maroon, that's the 75% coverage in females. Our current program has that blue line and no immunization is that flat line on top. So there would be no change if you don't immunize, so that's logical. And um, if you look at the introduced male immunization at the current levels, that's at 61%. The line just lies slightly above introducing female coverage at 75%. So for outcomes for females, it's looking like introducing coverage, or covering females more extensively is slightly better in terms of health outcomes, but very close to introducing males. And when you look at the male long-term incidence, this is where it's quite interesting. So the yellow line is the introducing males at the current level. And you can see initially up to about year 50, it's lying below uh, increasing female coverage. But then at that 50-year mark, they actually switch positions and increasing female coverage to 75% would actually have better health outcomes for males. So it's an interesting uh, concept to keep in mind, especially when you're thinking about equity, because not, not necessarily delivering the dose in the arm will have a better outcome for boys. Uh, so to discuss the results, uh, the current scenario is cost saving. Introducing routine female coverage is most cost effective with the greatest reductions in incidence. So if we could increase female coverage, it would be really great. However, immunizing boys is cost effective under commonly cited ICER cutoffs. And when you're thinking about the comparison between these two programs, keep in mind that 75% is a very high ceiling. And you also might be looking at additional costs to sort of encourage boys to become, or those girls who are sort of maybes to become immunized. So um, you actually might be looking at a higher ICER than is represented there. But the final decision is based on budget impact. So cost effective doesn't mean you can afford it. It means you might want to think about doing it. So just because something's cost effective doesn't mean it fits into your budget. So that's a very important consideration. Uh, ethical considerations and others um, will all fold into the decision. So this is just one piece of the puzzle. So the next steps for our analysis, uh, we're currently evaluating the Alberta data in Mark Brisson's model. So we're really looking forward to those results from a third model. And we're actually hopefully going to do a head-to-head -head comparison of the models using the same quality inputs, the same uh, efficacy inputs, uh, and hopefully releasing that publicly. All right, thank you.